and I'm extremely excited to hear what the di executive director of Medgar Evers College Cannabis Education Task Force has to share with you guys. Come on up here, Vicky. Hello. Hola. Buenas tardes. Um, I wanted to start in Spanish just to make sure everybody uh, is present. So I am known to many as Vicky Anna, Vicky, pain in the butt to my mom. Um, but today um, I'm going to be talking about the Legacy Core Foundation, which I'm a founder of. Uh, the Mega Evers College Cannabis Educational Task Force, I'm the executive director there, and we put, I don't know if you know about the program, but we put out in New York City the first cannabis degree minor program with 13 courses. So now when your mom says you can't go to school for cannabis, now you can. <laughs> but anyway, if you want more information, I have my awesome students here and they can vouch for it, or we have stuff in the back in terms of the courses. But moving right along, so I'm the founder of the Legacy Core Foundation, and my other two directors, Yosmira and Kendon, are there in the back. And basically, this was a foundation that was created after we did a severe cross-sectional study with legacy constituents throughout Brooklyn, Bronx, Queens, Manhattan. Any Staten Islanders? Islanders is that how you say it? Here? <laughs> I'm sorry, we didn't get there, so I just wanted to apologize. But basically, we did a lot of research, and we had intensive talks and interviews with these legacy constituents. And what we discovered was very amazing. And some of the resources that legacy constituents need, we then took that data, partnered with community agencies as well as academ academicians, and we put together modules that we're providing for free for legacy. So let's talk about this cross-sectional study. Uh, the question and the hypotheses that we really wanted to target and try to either validate or devalidate was, are legacy constituents the most vulnerable population within the cannabis industry? Now, I want you to think about this. Let's say I'm at work, and sometimes people feel the need to touch the hair, which I think is inappropriate. So let's say Kevin comes and touches my hair at work, and I say, oh, I'm uncomfortable. So I go to, I don't know, Naomi. Say, Naomi, please handle that, I'm uncomfortable. I have somebody I can go to. Or let's say, I own my own company, and I did it right, and I am my own boss, and I, I don't know, I own a pharmacy, and I order cases of different medications, and one of my suppliers sends me 10 cases of expired, not expired, but a month before expiration Tylenol. What am I gonna do with all these cases? I can send that back, right? I can report him at the Better Business Bureau. But if you're a legacy constituent, and you have these kind of issues, whether it be with the people you work with, your suppliers, depending on the type of legacy constitu constituent you are, who do you go to? Who do you have? And yes, legacy constituents do operate without, were anyway, I'm going to say were, um, operating without the permissions, and people can say, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. But in reality, they're humans just like us, and that's something that you have to take into account because it's a biopsychosocial factor that affects your entire self. So, the setting. What the setting was for these interviews, I didn't choose the, the, the interview settings, the clients did, and there was a lot of reports that were needed in terms of building with these different legacy constituents. Now, the methods that we used were the ERT method and the adaptive capacity method, as well as the SWOT analysis method. Does anybody know what ERT is? It's not a show. ERT stands for Experiential Race testimonies. And you see them when you have, for example, medical students, residents that need to be able to be empathetic with their patients. For example, you can have a male Caucasian from a suburban area, and he wants to now work in an urban area where there's a lot of BIPOC members. A patient comes in and says, oh, you have high blood pressure. What are you eating? The patient tells them, well, I eat McDonald's, and then I have some pizza. Now, if he's not empathetic, he'll tell them, well, don't eat that. But if he continues to engage in testimony, he'll understand that the patient has a food desert in his area. And so 
the more testimonies you get, the more empathetic you become and the closer you become to solving a problem. So that's what we did with the legacy constituents as we did these studies. Now, adaptive capacity is really measuring the pivotness of someone. Adaptive capacity is the thing that right now all businesses and organizations are paying for because it allows you to be very competitive. It's basically how can you move, can you flow with change, and the more you can, the better the business will do. Now, why the clicker isn't moving? Did my battery run out? Okay, here we go. So then let's go, I'm pushing through this because I was told nine minutes. Um, so now the results. The results that we got were very important. First of all, hmm, hmm. first of all, what we discovered was that about 90% of the legacy constituents that we interviewed were either critical mentors in their community, emblems of their community, hold down their community in either, in sometimes financial ways, outside of their own personal space. So when you think about legacy, I want you to think about women. I want you to think about baseball coaches. I want, to, I want you to think about the guy that even though he has this business, he's out there helping a lot of youth, right? But even more important than that, this, who? Oh, it's okay, this is the last slide. He, you took some of my minutes, so I'm gonna get them back. <laughs> anyway, so this was the most important part, and this is something that is very, very valuable. What we realized is that legacy constituents are already using TBL. Does anybody know what that is? It's not a sandwich. Okay, so the TBL is the triple bottom line um, concept theory and what it means is you're supposed to use the profit the people and the planet when you are trying to be sustainable in your business can you name me five or ten fortune 500 companies or blue chip companies that you know are checking all those three boxes no right but guess who are the legacy constituents and you know why because they have been operating in super volatile environments, and so they have to become Darwinistic. And Darwinism is strength, the, the, those who are most strongest succeed. But strength is really measured in your ability to pivot and change. And more than legacy constituents, I don't understand who can pivot more than them. So that is something very important because if the government wants to have real sustainable businesses, they should be using or bringing into the business people who are already checking this off. And so this research I'm now putting in peer-reviewed journals because it allows for a paper trail and it allows for um, politicians to be held accountable if the policy doesn't serve legacy constituents. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.